Yes, yes, yes. So Garvey, Marcus and Messiah Garvey came to America to meet up with the black American, African American, you could say Judahite, right, to, to meet up and to, to learn from Booker T, Booker T. Washington. But by the time Marcus and Messiah Garvey had come and had reached, you know, had reached America, he basically, um, Booker T. Washington had, had passed away. Right. So even that message that Garvey had said, right, in 1928, that's the legislature have said concerning looking to Africa, right, or looking to the East, looking to the East for where, you know, a black man. We heard a couple of different versions of it. We'd like to see it in print. But we do know the first printed statement to that effect was actually made in 1924 by the man named Reverend James Morris Webb. I think he's from Chicago. Some call him a Chicago mystic, but he was a preacher, a black preacher, a pastor, but he was a preacher of um, black liberation. Let's put it like that, a black liberation, you know, of the true gospel and the true interpretation of the Bible. So let's go forward because the first video, um, pardon brothers and sisters, the first video had ended a little bit suddenly. But what Garvey says right here, we do hope that Rastafari will live long to carry out his wonderful intentions from what we have heard and what we do know and this is where we had connected the other document here by um j a rogers j a rogers the real facts about ethiopia i think it was first printed in 1936 thank you thank you thank you yeah we just had to do this a little bit of fact check we've been focusing so much on the black america Right, Rastafari roots, you know, because many of us as Rastafari truly have focused on Jamaica and the Rastafari of Jamaica and even knowing some of the history of Jamaica that we just need to know about ourselves and our own roots in Rastafari. So Garvey first came to America circa 1916, 1916, came to America roughly around 1916, arrived after Booker T. Washington had died and um, was invited by Booker T. Washington. He was impressed with the work that Booker T. Washington had did and sought to expand the same, you know, well-doing and works with his people, our people in Jamaica. Yet the whole mail fraud thing and everything that happened, he was deported in 1927. So it was a year after that that he first made that proclamation concerning looking to the East, concerning the king and the black king and the day of liberation. Some, some have it as a day of liberation as a second part of the look to the East, look to Africa. So we've heard various different versions of this, but we are able to look at the documented statement of the first proclaimer and that is reverend james morris webb let's bring that out right there that's james morris webb right there on the left hand side for those looking at the vlog view so it's in 1928 so what we heard priest isaac in the truth of rastafari state was that it was march 1st if we are correct 1928 in a particular park, didn't get the full name, but it was a certain park that he proclaimed this in 1928. So many um, Jamaican or Rastafari of Jamaica and others would say that, well, this is when this word was first proclaimed that gave the connectivity to Rastafari and don't say, well, the Rastafari movement began then. But they are incorrect with that because Rastafari movement, because they began with the movement of Rastafari, the man, Rastafari, the first Rastafari is the Rastafari of Ethiopia, Lij Tafari, that man child growing up, coming to the full manhood and stature that we know as Rastafari. And he became, you could say, Rastafari, the title of Ras or Prince or Head in circa 1916. 1916. We know this from the autobiography of his imperial majesty the rastafari katamawi haile selassie just to point out some of those basic facts right there so in 1924 i think september 20 25th 1924 and to heal up rastafari tv 
Fanai Sunlight Sight Media, I and I Digital Angel, who has built a platform for us as Rastafari, Rastafari TV. It's on the Rastafari TV page and site and platform. The article we'll go into that a little bit, a little bit more in detail. But as we said, this is a basic kind of an overview, basic overview, a, a context, right, to put the important facts of Rastafari in better context. So first of all, Rastafari does not begin in Jamaica, but in Ethiopia. Jamaica becomes an important lighthouse, true indeed, of Rastafari, but even in the 1920s, it has been recorded that there was the first church of Rastafari in Louisiana, New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, New Orleans, Louisiana in the 1920s and kind of interesting because on, on my personal um, parental father, my father's side, my patriarch side, my roots go back to Louisiana, New Orleans. And I think that's interesting. My mother's side is the Geechee Gullah, right? the Geechee Gullah Nation, right? the Georgia Sea Islands. So in a sense, we are island people as well. You see, when we don't know these things, then COINTELPRO can divide and conquer and confuse us and play this tribal game to tribal war to get us to destroy each other or to say that you're not real and you're not real and so forth and so on. And instead of recognizing what our respective reality is, especially our, our reality in Rastafari and Rastafari. But let's just go through this right here. We began in the first video. Right, the first part, this is the second part here, going back to what was written in The Black Man in Kingston, November 8th, 1930. So, roughly six days later, Garvey said these words here We do hope that Rastafari will live long to carry out his wonderful intentions. From what we have learned and what we do know, he is ready and willing to extend the hand of invitation to any Negro who desires to settle in his kingdom. We know of many who are gone to Abyssinia and who have given good report of the great possibilities there, which they are striving to take advantage of. A little note here on Abyssinia. It's his Imperial Majesty said that the name of this Rastafari that said and declared that the name of the country is really Ethiopia. So you will hear Ethiopia and Abyssinia. It depends on which particular European um, perspective, you know, because different European nations. So sometimes these misnomers come to us because we get a lot of or have gotten many, much information sometimes through you know, some of the European reports or the so-called white people's reports and scholarship and, you know, so just to note that right there. Next part, it says, the psalmist prophesied that princes will come out of Egypt and Ethiopia will stretch forth her hands to God. We have no doubt that the time is now come. These are the words of Marcus Messiah Garvey. Ethiopia is now really stretching forth her hands. This great kingdom of the East has been hidden for many centuries, but gradually she is rising to take a leading place in the world. And it is for us of the Negro race to assist in every way to hold up the hands of Emperor Rastafari. Now, this is how Garvey's black man Kingston, November 8th, 1930, proclamation and publication. This is how it sums up right here. Now, even though at that time, the emperor, the king of kings, right, that new name upon the throne of great King David is Kedamawi Hala Selassie. And just a note, you heard priest Isaac said that Hala Selassie, the name is, is, is um, Amharic, and he seemed to have insisted that. That is uh, factually incorrect. Factually, it's Ethiopic, it's Gutus, it's a Gutus con construct. Haile, Haile, Le means power of. Haile means my power. If it was Amharic, it would be Yes Selase Hail. Yes Selase Hail if it was Amharic. But because it's Gutus, Haile Selase, 
baptismal name upon the throne of great King David, the first king upon that throne in that Hebrew Israelite establishment in the tops of the mountains upon the throne of great King David, Kedamawi, thus Kedamawi, the first, the first of that name to be seated upon the throne of great King David. Stay tuned for another reason of how the ancient black Israelites made Ethiopia holy. <laughs> Got to bring that forward. Now, here in Brother, Brother Ayurid's book, Sarata Nigus, the order of the coronation, or Sarata means the order of kinging, Nigus, or coronation in translation. He goes on to write this here. He says, following upon the tide of already flourishing messianic anticipations. Once again, following. In other words, following what Garvey said in The Black Man. That was following on the tide. Right? He's riding the tide. No man, no man starts the, 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 the wave like in, in the ocean, right? the waters. Right? No man can start a wave, you know, but man rides the wave. It's how you ride that wave. Following upon the tide of already flourishing messianic, the black messiah, messianic anticipations, those streams within the broad Ethiopianist, Ethiopianist movement that felt further inclined to focus on the prophetic aspects so there's a focusing on Rastafari Kanamawi Hala Selassie from the prophetic aspects of this majestic event identified in it the fulfillment of biblical promise of the Messiah's return on earth and in the earth according to a genuinely Afrocentric perspective. Afrocentric perspective. So even these words like Afrocentric and even in J.A. Rogers' books, it seems from the 1930s, 36, black people identify themselves not as African Americans, but as Afra Americans. And then also we came across the nomenclature of Afra Jamaican. Right? So the genuinely Afri Afrocentric perspective. This quote overstanding. Overstanding footnote here, a Rastafari key word intended to improve the positivity and insight of the English word understanding seemed to carry a linguistic echo of the word understanding carrying a linguistic echo of a colonial mental sub under subjugation. So we have overstanding. And as I and I teach it all, the root of Understanding and overstanding, right, is the standing, right? So first we need to get, of course, the understanding of a thing, then the, the inner standing, the inner standing to come to an overstanding, but the, the ground is how we standing, right? Especially, but not exclusively, arose in the island of Jamaica, this idea of overstanding, thus literally igniting the manifestation of these times of the movement known by the very name of the King of Kings of Ethiopia, Negusa Neges Ze Ethiopia. Now, see, that's the correct translation of that. King of Kings, Negusa Neges Ze of Ethiopia. But the European translators often translate that as emperor. So wherever you see emperor, concerning Ethiopia and concerning his majesty in the Ethiopian language, the royal Amharic language from the Ge'ez, it is literally biblical prophecy, it is literally king of kings. Some may say Negusa Nagas, but literally Negusa Nagas, king of kings at Ethiopia before his coronation. Rastafari, known to be the king messiah of the Israelite tradition. So we look at our, as Rastafari Israelites and as black Americans, our, our roots in Rastafari, because the roots of Rastafari, Ethiopia, but our roots in Rastafari, these are two key black men, mine, at either, either side of the King of Kings. One is the prophet, 
Reverend James Morris Webb. And the next is the priest, Rabbi Arnold Wentworth Massey. Now, also, we have Arnold Josiah Ford as well. But the one who carried it even forward further was Rabbi Arnold Wentworth Massey. Just a little more, a little more, right? The text of the Order of Coronation is a document of unparalleled value, just to point this out, as it allows the historic event to be seen in its original context. First of all, as an expression of Ethiopian traditions, as ancient as human history, uniquely enabling modern knowledge to interpret the balance between the Hebrew and Christian elements. And this is what we have here in our black American, you know, Negro Judahite here in this North country, right? The balance between the Hebrew, I know we said the Hebrew, Israelite, Jew, Judaic, as well as the black messianic nazarene and christian elements as found in the original message of christ and his disciples and preserved in their pristine we could say african conception whereof israelite culture of biblical times was an otherwise lost expression now this is what's so very key because this document you know was published you know, as of late, I think in the new millennia, right, in the 2000s. Let's just go right here in the 2000s, right? And here we just go look at this year, 2013. We have 2013, the date of this document right here. Um, and what the author and the researcher is bringing forward here, right, the Israelite culture of biblical times, the balance between the Hebrew and the Christian elements and the original message of Christ and his disciples. So here for I and I, as we say, black Americans, right? Or black American Rastafari, the revelation amongst I and I, we have the balance of the, of the Hebrew, right? We, the black Jews of Harlem, right? As well as the, the Christian or the true Christian, right elements balance as well but in the western whitewashed gentile anglo-american sense it had been lost this it was a lost expression a footnote here says footnote right here well there's actually two footnotes right here the footnote before says for a genuine and crucial testimony of the early manifestation of rastafari faith and movement see the work of elder douglas r a mack it's a book called From Babylon to Rastafari. It was published in Chicago, 1999. And for an overview of the historical origins of the movement and its priorities, um, I think uh, Julia Bonacci, Exodus, Le Histoire um, de, du Retour, I'm mean, not too good with French, Des Rastafarian in Ethiopia. Ethiopia, um, Paris, 2008. The second footnote, the African substance, this connect with loss expression, right? That's lost, especially in the West, right? And how it had been recovered amongst our first proclaimers, right? Here, Negroes here in this North country, right? Black Americans, Afro-Americans. The African substance of the original biblical Israelite culture is a central tenet of the Ethiopianist and Rastafari worldviews and was already demonstrated by the great Reverend James Morris Webb in 1910. You check that? So Garvey first comes to America in 1916. We have Reverend James Morris Webb, 1910. He had a booklet. The booklet is called some of y'all may be familiar with this. If not, we have to get a reprint as well um, of this document for the LOJ, the line of Judah College and University Studies. The black man, the father of civilization proven by biblical history. Once again, the book by Reverend J.M. Webb is The Black Man, 
the father of civilization proven by biblical history. And we submit that there's a lot of confusion amongst a lot of sincere seekers because these documents have not been first consulted so we can have a chronological revelation. All right, put things in the proper context. The same author, Reverend James Morris Webb, J.M. Webb, right, in 1919, he published A Black Man Will Be the Coming Universal King Proven by Biblical History. So you have these two documents, one in 1910 and one in 1919. 1919 document, A Black Man will be the coming universal king proven by biblical history now for all the black jews and hebrew israelites that know the language and especially the commandment keepers royal order hail up to zion lex as well abdiel ben levi check this out what do we say in our prayers hebraically baruch atarunai eloheinu malech haolam Baruch Atarunai, bless art thou, Lord, Eloheinu, our God, Melech HaOlam, King of the Universe. But that can also be translated as Universal King. So this is a text of capital. Capital, to say the capital of something is like the head, the ras, the rosh, right? It's of capital importance for the messianic messianic expectation within the Ethiopianist movement. And as another little footnote here, this idea of an Ethiopianist movement, many of us thought that, well, it began in Ethiopia because it's called Ethiopianist, and some say Ethiopianism, but actually it began from scholars and seekers over here in this North country, black Americans, Negroes here in the Americas, this idea. But it was an idea that was maybe coined like that, and then it was carried into the Ethiopian consciousness under the Ethiopian term um, Ethiopiawi, Ethiopiawi, right? Ethiopiawi net in the in the Ethiopic sense. And anybody who understands Amharic would know that that is a, a later development, right, in the language to express something, right, that was birthed or born later on. <laughs> In other words, so a text of capital importance for the messianic tradition or the black messiah expectation within the Ethiopianist movement and for the consequent early Rastafari identification of the king of kings of Ethiopia, Nugusa Negase, Ethiopia, as the crowned messiah. This is from the notes here, and we would just add to that the crowned, the anointed and crowned. It's important because the anointing of the king, based on that Israelite tradition, this is where we know the true Moshiach, the true Messiah, or Messiah Hebraically, from the root means anointed. An interesting discussion on the centrality of the Israelite identification among specific Ethiopianist groups and thinkers in the West. And we say the West, we're saying North America, right? We're saying the Caribbean, we're saying also South and Central. America as well. Ethiopianist, specific Ethiopianist groups and thinkers in the West is that of, and this document, you've heard us speak about this before, and we're speaking about this again by Howard M. Broats. It's called The Black Jews of Harlem, Negro Nationalism and the Dilemmas of Negro Leadership. Again, the full title is the Black Jews of Harlem, Negro Nationalism, and the Dilemmas of Negro Leadership. Now, the Black Jews of Harlem focuses a lot on the Rabbi Arnold Wentworth Matthew community known as the Commandment Keepers, Ethiopian Hebrew Congregation of Elohim Chaim of the Living God. This was published in New York, 1964, but is based on researches that go all the way to the 30s and even to the former movement before that, the Morris Zionist right, Jews, the Morris Zionist um, Jews, you know, that link right there as well. Look more here for a general discussion of the differences between ancient Israelite culture 
in its African setting. This is a, a, a very good point of note here. Ancient Israelite culture in its African setting, especially east of the river now, and modern Judaism, another reference here, see also Kohana, Michael, Mikael, Ben Levi, Israelites and Jews, the significant difference by Beer publication 1997, 1997. Now there's, there's some more here, but we're just going to conclude this particular section that we began off with right here. This particular section, um, where are we along this order right here? Okay, boom. Furthermore, as a natural consequence, the context is the rejuvenating message of redemption, the rejuvenating message of redemption and liberation that the event, speaking about the coronation of the Rastafari Kedemawi Hala Selassie, right, reawakened through its sheer magnificence, thereby inaugurating a season of moral expectations established on principles of universal justice and equal rights, or we'll say human rights, according to what the Bible indicates and foretells what the Bible, the scriptures, rightly understood, rightly express and explain, indicates and foretells concerning the time the ancient prophets knew as, quote, the days of the Messiah, end quote. The days of the Messiah. And to put it in the context of the movement of our peoples, the days of the black Messiah. There's a verse of scripture. We show this verse of scripture, um, um, restoration, right? The, the restoration. This is the times of restoration. Check this verse first, firstly. Roots of, the roots of Rastafari, scripturally, biblically, Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, that, that light of Rastafari, right? the lightning coming out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now these words here are often in Christianity associated with... Um, Right, um, the the second advent, right of Christ, right, or as we would say, Christ in His kingly character. Boom, there we go. That last part right here that he writes, where he says, thereby inaugurating a season, like a dispensation, a time, a season of moral expectations based on principles of universal justice and equal rights. We will say that as universal justice and human. Right. According to what the Bible indicates and foretells concerning the time the ancient prophets knew as, quote, the days of the Messiah, end quote. And to put it in today's context, the days of the black Messiah. And here's the verse right here linking this. Acts 3 and 19. Repent ye. Now repent. Not to get it all spooked out, as some of the Christians and some ones and ones in counterfeit Christianity do. Look, metano, metano, no, eo, metano, eo, metanoia, metano, eo. This word for repent, as you can see from Thea's de definition, means to change one's mind. You know, like, like, you know, before we had, that's why we say John the Baptist, Marcus Garvey, he, he was like one who did a great baptism, right, of a majority of people. Though there were other prophets, there were other ones who were sent with that spirit of truth, the word of truth, because of the Holy Spirit. He was that one, right, that basically, based on his work, was able to baptize a bunch of us, right, getting us from that, that like no good so-called nigger, negro, you know, mentality to change our minds to have a more as one could say a more positive upful look at who we are and what our potential 
is as a people, once lost, now found. To change one's mind, to repent, to change one's mind for better, heartily, to amend with abhorrence, to amend, to, to make amends, right? With abhorrence, like a, a disgust of one's past sins, our past uckeries as a people, right? Here, Strong's definition bring out metanoeo, right? Metanoia, metanoeo, to think differently. No, see, it, it didn't begin with the Mac computer, think differently. <laughs> right? But here, it began, think differently, right? Or afterwards to reconsider, morally to feel compunction, right? Based on this half of the story that hasn't been told to us, but revealed to us here in these latter days and times of the times of the Gentiles, the times of the Anglo-American, the European whitewash, you know, the times of the nation states, the Gentiles. So here, here, look a bit more on this, brothers and sisters. Sisters and brothers, just to share this right here, right, right here. So our, our, for we, black American and black America's Rastafari roots and we, the black Jews, our black American, um, Hebrew and Judeo-Christian, unique Hebrew and Judeo-Christian culture, that if the truth be told, as one of the Khabarim, one of I and I brothers said, you know, we are the most hated and the most imitated. And notice something, there's a biblical prophecy concerning Judah or the Negroes of North America. To Judah shall the gathering of who? Of the peoples be. Notice that when they come to this North country and we come together here, then they and their movement becomes great. The example, Marcus Garvey, for example. Yes, brothers and sisters, look a little more, little more to come. Just here, here, here. First part of this right here. And we'll get into some more details. Have a couple of more exhibits to share. Oh, P.S. Reverend James Morris Webb, Reverend J.M. Webb, or Reverend James Webb as he's known, and this you can find at Rastafari TV, Site Media. Um, uh, Charles Price, he, he, he writes this in Becoming Rasta, Origins of Rastafari Identity in Jamaica, page 47. He says, perhaps some people confuse Garvey's ideas with those of Reverend James Webb who in 1924 pronounced the coming of a redeeming, redeeming, look to Africa where a black man will be crowned king. In him you will find a redeemer. These are the words that the first proclaimer, we could say on record, before Garvey. So Garvey caught this proclamation and he continued to proclaim it to people who would not have heard it, right, in Jamaica and elsewhere. Right? But perhaps some people confuse Garvey's ideas with those of Reverend James Webb, who in 1924 pronounced the coming of a redeeming black king in a speech delivered in Liberty Hall. In Liberty Hall. So you can see this right here, Universal King. Right? Just to zoom in on that. Right? Negro Universal King with Wooly here is coming to rule the world proven by biblical history. Right? And also Universal Negro King coming to rule the world. These two exhibits right here. Right? The Negro characters in the Bible. Right? So when we hear black people saying that, oh, they, they, they're still in this whitewash, it's because these works have been suppressed or distorted or misinterpreted. Right? Most hated. Right, most imitated. Jesus was a Negro by blood, right? Linking even with the Kemetic, you know, community on the level. King Tut was a Negro by blood, and it's interesting. Even to this very day, there's ones and ones who still are trying to distort, you know, what's so clear and evident. Even when looking at ancient Egypt, King Solomon was a Negro by blood, right? This is the brother right here, ethnology of the Bible. Elder J. M. Webb, as we can see this right here, Elder J. M. Webb, the subject of this lecture, 
you know, this presentation was that Jesus, Solomon, and Queen of Sheba were born out of black tribes. Huh? Out of black tribes. And had Ethiopian or Negro blood in their veins. And this is why I say one has to be aware of that Zondervan Bible Dictionary. Right? It's confusing the original Hebrew Israelite inspiration from our patriarchs and matriarchs. You know? So we'll touch on that as well right there. Brothers and sisters, this is the brother right here. Right? Right? Famous picture of Jesus was a black... Boom! There's the book right there. Black Man Father of Civil Civilization. One of the publications, one of the covers out there, James Morris Webb. Right, AM. Right, I think this is another one right here. Yes, the man child of Revelation. Revelation chapter 12.